So we've got some questions for you, Jennifer. At this particular time when we have Skills England, we know some things, we don't know the whole picture. But obviously, we also want to look a little bit back in terms of your learnings and your reflections on the Institute for Apprenticeships and Technical Education. So maybe we should start from that. So learnings, reflections? Yeah. Wow, well, uh, it's a very interesting uh, day for me today because I think some of you will know the, uh, the bill to abolish IFATE was introduced in, in the Lords yesterday. Uh, so uh, it's really nice to be here today to have a little opportunity to reflect on, uh, on all of that. I mean, in terms of kind of learning, I think I'd probably, I'd probably point to three things in terms of what, what I would think of as things that are important that IFATE has thought about and tried to do, which I would hope that sort of Skills England will reflect on as it, as it, as it kind of gets going from its shadow form and into its, into its sort of fully fledged existence in the spring. I think the, uh, the three things would really be around um, systems thinking, uh, collaboration and quality. Um, so uh, in terms of sort of system thinking, one of the things that, that has really struck me over the last five years or so is, um, is how interconnected everything is in skills. Uh, and the risk, I think, for policymakers that you get quite excited about a particular bit of the skill system and reforming a particular thing, let's say it's T-levels or uh, uh, you know, short duration apprenticeships or whatever it is, and you pull that kind of lever without really thinking about the implications of that change for the whole of the system. And also, how do you make sure that 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 change is really going to be implemented effectively. So what's the story in terms of, you know, how is the sector going to implement it? You know, what's your support for teachers who are going to deliver these things and so forth? What's your funding approach? What are your incentives to drive people to do those things? So thinking about a kind of a systems, a systems approach. One of the things that we tried to do in IFA was to create a sort of uh, a simpler skill system, so a kind of a map of qualifications and apprenticeships based on those occupational standards that employers had developed. And I think as we go forward, lots of the panel have talked about uh, creating much greater flexibility in the system and modular, modularizing things and making it easy for people to do shorter, shorter courses and so forth, which I think is definitely got to be the next sort of evolution of, of, of the system. That obviously introduces even more complexity. So thinking about that in terms of how do you uh, create a system story, a narrative that people can understand. And I would like to think that the kind of occupational maps would be a, a kind of a the foundation of that, that you could grow your apprenticeships and your variety of qualifications and your modules all, all, all off of that. Uh, so system thinking would be one. I think collaboration um, would be my second. Uh, so uh, when I when I joined IFATE uh, just shy of five years ago, uh, one of the first things I did was to go to a, a sort of all staff event with my predecessor Jerry Berrigan doing a bit of a sort of outgoing talk, and he showed this video of um, it was one of those David Attenborough things where you've got like a, a small kind of gecko thing jumping over the rocks with thousands of snakes all coming after it and trying to catch it and eat it and what have you. And he said, "That's I fate. Uh, I fate was this poor little gecko." Uh, and I like to think that uh, over the last five years we've we've definitely shifted from that that sort of situation where we thought everyone was out to get us uh, to a position where actually we've got really good collaborative working relationships with people across the sector and looking out here I can see lots of uh, friends and colleagues that we've worked with really successfully so you know a collaborative approach uh, for Skills England going forward I think would be the way to go um, and then my final point would be around uh, would be around the, the kind of the essentials of quality. Um, so uh, you know the new government's really looking to draw more people into the skill system, get more people training, really stimulate skills in order to feed growth and productivity. It has to come from a quality base. So you know if it's if it's about getting more people in by dropping the standards, I think we won't be doing anybody any favours. So those would be my three reflections, Katarina. They're all very good. So it's about thinking big. Oh, I always in, think in big. Terms of the You've got to think big. Work hard. Thinking think out. Big, be kind. Collaborate. <laughs> so go out. Think. Uh, you know, get out. Go out. Collaborate. And and that and then go deep. You know, quality. Making sure that. Um, no, that's really wonderful. And actually, a nice kind of handover. Almost. You know, think about these three things, and you're probably going to be in a better place. I have a couple of. Um, uh, 
if you like, uh, questions around things that have been kind of announced. So, you know, the challenge opportunities of a skills levy or the, uh, the role of foundation apprenticeships. So these kind of things that are coming in uh, as new and how new are they? And what would you say uh, to those kind of uh, recent uh, announcements? Yeah, so, um, I mean, I think, I, think it's, um, I think it's really welcome that the government are looking at broadening out the stuff that the levy can pay for. Uh, we've been uh, uh, very clear, I think, uh, under the previous government that the levy was just about apprenticeships and that was the policy choice that was made. Uh, that was kind of in the face of quite a lot of people saying, you know, well, you know, that doesn't really make a lot of sense. We need some other products. Uh, and I think IFAC was always very clear that we didn't think that apprenticeships should be the only show in town. You know, there's got to be a whole range of different training uh, avenues for the whole range of different people that we need to bring into the system to help them to kind of um, upskill and retrain and so forth as we've been talking this morning. Um, but uh, you know, there have been a number of announcements at uh, just around about conference time, so the level seven apprenticeships, obviously, um, uh, and, and what's going to happen there, short duration apprenticeships and the um, uh, foundation apprenticeships. Uh, one of the things I think we've, we've been working in the background on trying to influence um, DFE around is that access piece because I think we've done a, a really good job of kind of raising the standards in terms of the, the, you know, what people are getting out of apprenticeships. And we've talked a bit today, I think, about how the sector needs to be a bit more confident and a bit more you know, talking itself up a bit more. I don't know if anyone's had a chance to read the most recent um, apprenticeship evaluation report that came out uh, very recently, uh, independent evaluation of apprenticeships showing 87% uh, of people saying that they were satisfied with their apprenticeship and 91% of people saying that it gave them an opportunity to progress. You know, I mean, that is phenomenally successful results, you know, and it's just kind of like that's been put out and nothing much has been said about it. Um, but uh, thinking about the, uh, uh, you know, like the increasing that range of, uh, of different options that can be funded from, uh, from the, the new uh, skills and growth levy, I think, is a good thing. The challenge, of course, is that, you know, how do you make those choices? And uh, uh, it's going to be a finite pot. Uh, and how do you make sure that you're getting uh, the, as much skills gain from that money uh, as you can possibly as you can possibly get? Um, but then I'd go back to my first point about systems thinking. You know, you need to. Uh, I would really. I'm encouraging as much as I possibly can uh, the, the the new government and uh, DfE officials to think about this as a system uh, and not to kind of make some twiddles here and a few twiddles there that don't really connect and think about what the implications are for that whole the whole system. So let's move to Skills England a bit and just consider uh, the conversation we've just had this morning, the national versus uh, the, the regional, the local skills gaps. What would be uh, your ask to Skills England in terms of a nationals versus local? Yeah, well, I think that I, I would hope national not versus local for a start. So I would I would hope that it isn't set up in opposition to, uh, to, to local areas. Um, We've had some interesting conversations around the sort of setup, and uh, clearly it's happening in the context of greater devolution. And there is sometimes a, an unfortunate starting point to those kinds of conversations that goes along the lines of, well, as we devolve more funding, Skills England will need to hold local areas to account for what they're doing on skills. And I think that is completely the wrong way to think about it. So I'm kind of saying to people, you know, you, you know, you need to devolve more funding and Skills England needs to support local areas to meet their skills needs. So thinking about how can Skills England create new provision. If you guys are finding out that you haven't got the right, uh, uh, the right apprenticeships available or the right qualifications or the right modules or whatever, how can it be really responsive and agile and, getting sure, and making sure that those things are, are put into the system so that you can use them and you can be funded to use them quickly? Um, so it, it, it would definitely be about a kind of collaborative and supportive relationship, I would hope, uh, than one that is adversarial or, uh, you know, the, I th what was the model um, Ollie was quoting? Uh, I'll get the acronym wrong, but, you know, new policy, whatever it was. But that kind of thing, you know, let's not do that, please. And final question for you, which I will ask everybody in the collective as well to answer and give us some points for us both to take away, perhaps, which is... What are your key asks 
from Skills England? If you had that wish list, what would it look like? Oh, gosh. <laughs> I have got a long list, actually, but I won't go through all of it. Um, uh, you know, I think we have made some uh, real strides over the last uh, the last five years. I would love Skills England to be building on what we've already put in place. Um, so they're, uh, you know, the board of IFA are quite an interesting bunch. They're like mainly employers, and some of them have been involved in kind of mergers and acquisitions and stuff over the years. So they talk to me as if this is a kind of a merger acquisition going on. Uh, IFA's being acquired by Skills England. You know, how do you monetize the stuff that we got, you know, the, the, the sort of occupational maps? The huge goodwill of employers who've been working with us, a huge goodwill of uh, training providers and awarding organizations that have got those relationships. You don't want to lose those in the transition, you know, so how, you know, bringing that in, capitalizing and building on, on all of that, building on the 700 odd uh, occupational standards that employers have invested time in. If you, if you monetized it, I think we've got a couple of million quids worth of stuff in there that people have built uh, you know by giving their free time to create in this system so let's start from there and let's let's work on the bits that can really benefit from improvement you know I'm not suggesting for a minute that the system is perfect it definitely isn't so it's really about focusing there rather than let's you know scorch the earth and start again um, I would hope <laughs> so it's very much about building up and improving. well that's what the Secretary of State be, said that would be <laughs> So, open to the collective, what are your key asks of Skills England? Anyone want to shout out or do you want me to run to you with mics? What would you... I, I thought that. I said that. I said that to Katerina in the coffee break. I said we look like a kind of a bunch of holly or something, don't we? Well, nearly the Italian flag. <laughs> Hi, uh, Fiona Aldridge. Um, uh, last couple of weeks ago, West Midlands Combined Authority um, just moved to a role at Skills Federation. Um, I'd, I'd be really interested, Jennifer, in your reflections on employer engagement in the skills system and what Skills England needs to do to get this right. We've heard a lot about employers in the driving seat and employer responsive system. There's been some challenges about um, how we engage only with big employers who've got the time and capacity and what does that mean for small employers. I wondered what your reflections and best advice for Skills England is about how it properly engages with employers and industry so that it it, it has a right place for them, mm. um, that it gets beyond individual firms' decision-making and gets to those firms that might not be able to give out the capacity to engage with a big national system. Yeah, yeah. So I think a couple of things. Um, so thing one, I think, uh, you know, I think we would recognise in IFA that it's been really hard to get uh, representative groups of employers together to work on particular uh, apprenticeships and standards because, as you say, you know, actually, you're a small business in Solihull. You're, you're busy running your business, aren't you? You're not going to spend time coming up to London and spending a day uh, with people like me in a room um, uh, working on, on standards. So I think there was a recognition around that, that one of the things that, that we would hope, I think, will become um, a feature of the work of Skills England is a much bigger um, reliance on kind of data. So we've got, we're now in a position um, to capture uh, vacancy data, to scrape vacancies. It's a horrible phrase, but to scrape vacancies so that you can see, at a, you know, a macro level, what is being asked for, you know, on Tuesday for a particular occupation. So you'll start to see much more quickly what um, businesses are actually asking for, and you're not necessarily having. You can supplement those personal conversations with, with uh, interested employers with a much wider range of data. So that's one thing. I think the second thing um, that I would hope Skills England will uh, recognise is that um, there are, there are, there are the need for kind of different kinds of engagement at different levels within the system. Uh, and, you know, we've seen through our work um, recently with uh, local areas and uh, mayor or combined authorities, the rich relationships that local areas have got with, with businesses in their local communities. Uh, and, the, the you know, being able to kind of tap into that and to use local areas as mechanisms for getting to a much 
broader sweep uh, of small and medium-sized employers and bringing that into the party and not expecting those employers to come to you. Uh, and my final thing was don't expect employers to read reports like the one that came out the other day from Skills England that's a sort of 70 pages of data on skills. That's really not going to happen. <laughs> I've got two questions, if that's okay. First, Philip. Yeah, thank you very much. And I uh, completely agree with your point about our need to talk positively about the, the, the things that we see as being our strengths as a system. W one area where we uh, certainly differentiated from other developed economies is in um, higher technical skills, and particularly level four and five. And there's a bit of a, a missing middle there. Uh, I'm interested in your view of, and, and if you could sort of unshackle yourself from the constraints of funding and uh, other things, what would you think needs to happen to see um, you know, more uptake of particularly level four and five so we can get those high technical skills in our system that can support the, the growth agenda? Yeah, so um, that's a good question. Um, I think at the moment we've got the, the, the sort of work that uh, is going into Skills England is going to be helpful in this uh, regard. Um, so the sort of four chunks of stuff, there's the stuff about sort of future skills needs and future planning so people can see a bit more uh, of a data-led approach in terms of where those gaps are going to be emerging. The chunk of stuff around local planning, so uh, local skills and growth plans and connecting the sort of national standards setting the plans for prioritizing which apprenticeships get developed next which uh, um, technical qualifications get delivered next with a view to what it is that local areas are saying they need which doesn't we haven't got that connective tissue yet so I think that's going to be really important obviously the work that my organization has been doing around uh, developing those products and then that kind of national kind of um, convening piece looking across other government departments and looking at what their skills needs are coming up from their sectors all of that will sort of feed into uh, the creation of this kind of new system all of that is sort of supply side stuff though isn't it it's the kind of we're creating opportunities for people um, I think the thing that I'm hopeful for I'm always optimistic the thing I'm optimistic for uh, is the skill strategy uh, which I'm hoping will have the, um, the complementary piece, which is the demand side strategy. So how are we going to get more people, and we've talked a bit about adults here, uh, particularly to say, actually, I'm going to do that course, I'm going to take that qualification, I'm going to spend some time in the evenings doing this, or, uh, you know, I'm actually going to try and, try and, you know, what is a strategy for that? Because that is you know, is as important and harder, I think, than creating the supply, uh, the supply side. So I'm hopeful that they, that when they're thinking about the skills strategy, they will have that piece. Uh, and the, you know, the complementary piece of that, of course, is what we've been talking t about today in terms of pedagogy, in terms of support for the sector, in terms of, you know, making sure that uh, professionals in the sector are continually uh, getting opportunities to access the best professional development opportunities out there so they want to stay in the sector, continue to grow and develop and progress, progress their careers. So I, I'm putting in the skill strategy bucket, so we'll have to see what that looks like when it comes out, Phil. <laughs> And we had a final one. Kasim, lovely to see you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Kasim Hosseini, uh, National Union of Students, Vice President for Further Education. Thank you for sharing your reflections. Um, I was quite interested in when you're talking about collaboration, um, because I've been speaking to a lot of students and apprentices, and I think the terminology of Skills England isn't quite easy on them. <laughs> um, so I guess my advice would be what sort of mechanisms would you sort of advise trying to put students and apprentices in the driving seat and part of the decision making process because like I think we all agree that the social partnership has to have students right in the middle of it um, just as important as the other people. Yeah no no it's a it's a very good challenge and um, I mean I think one of the things that we did um, uh, under my leadership was create our own um, apprentice panel because we were busy talking to employers and thinking we're going to make this system great if we just do what employers say and actually there's this whole constituency of people that were you know taking uh, undertaking the training that weren't being kind of listened to so we created our own uh, apprentice panel and I hope that Skills England will do something similar to try to get really good representation of, uh, of people who are actually undertaking training or taking qualifications in colleges and uh, and in business
businesses up and down the country right into the heart of that um, uh, decision-making process. And I would hope that um, it isn't just a kind of a lip service thing where you can just point to the panel and say, oh, we've involved some young people or, you know, we've got some apprentices here to advise us that they're actually able to influence policy. So uh, our panel um, worked with us a few years ago to create a whole different, a whole guide for um, apprentice employers on what is, you know, what would it look like from an apprentice's perspective to be a great apprentice employer? Uh, and that kind of um, changed DfE policy around training plans and stuff like that at the front end of an apprenticeship. So really starting to give people an opportunity to influence would be where I would go. Um, I also think, just while I've got you, <laughs> I think you know there's there's something for the NUS here about the whole FE system and you know the value that's placed on it and the pay. You know, you guys should be marching in the streets. Don't quote me. Uh, marching in the streets, campaigning on this thing. You know, it's it's you know. Uh, anyway, Definitely. yeah, oh, agreed. <laughs> Again, a fantastic conversation, and thank you for joining us. And what a timely. Uh, conversation as well, mm. hot off the press with a lot of great reflections and forward looking with optimism, opportunity. Uh, and I think what I'm taking away from this conversation, Jennifer, is your focus on systems thinking, collaboration and quality as key ingredients of success. Uh, that skill strategy needing to be strategic, <laughs> it sounds funny, but actually the importance of that, uh, the, impo the equal importance of focus on access, and the, the student and apprentice voice uh, to be to ensure that it is kind of balanced with the employer voice as well. So thank you so much. We are, uh, it's wonderful to have you here. And I'm sure everybody will appreciate uh, what they've heard as well. So thank you. Thank you.